This is the paper three advanced information whole paper walkthrough. What we're going to be doing in the session today is we're going to be listening to the advice and guidance on each question. You are going to be encouraged to pause the video and attempt to write your answer out in time conditions and then we're going to be reflecting on your answer and reviewing the mark scheme together. So the first section we're going to be looking at is the common uh, section that everyone will be assessed on in paper three. So that is the issues and debates in psychology, which will be a total uh, mark of 24 marks for that section. Um, you're going to have a go at answering all the questions in this section. And like we said before, really encourage you to pause the video for each, for each question. And then we'll be going through and reviewing the mark scheme. So let's start with the first question. So explain what is meant by socially sensitive research for four marks. So here, when we say explain what is meant, we are defining socially sensitive uh, research and what it means, but we're doing so um, in quite a lot of detail, um, mainly because it's four marks. So we're not just giving a one mark definition. We really want to elaborate and the examiner really wants to see you explain what this means, perhaps by giving an example in some cases. But the point is for four marks, this is going to be roughly about five minutes of writing for your answer. So socially sensitive research, just to remind you, comes under our, our ethics section for the advanced specification for issues and debates. So if you want to have a go pausing now and have a go answering this for five minutes we'll be going through the mark scheme in a short moment okay so let's have a look at the mark scheme together so we can see here because it's four marks this was marked in levels and we know that it was cyber and stanley used this term originally in 1988 uh, and they attempt to describe what it means when studies have a potential social consequence for not just the participants but the group of people that may be represented by the particular piece of research so there are various kind of aspects that can be raised in terms of ethical implications when it comes to socially sensitive research such as you know how how the findings are going to be used, you know, those application findings um, and the research question itself. Now, of course, you can um, model this on a particular topic if you want to kind of bring out and explain the term socially sensitive. So um, quite a nice, easy one from um, paper one is Bowlby's monotropic theory, you know, how that research is going to be used and the application of the findings. Perhaps it's going to be used to justify women staying at home and not actually going out to work um, because as his theory stated the importance of the mother in that critical period in those first few years. So we can see here with the levels, uh, the top marks, three to four marks, so level two, your explanation needs to be mostly clear and accurate and needs to be coherent with effective use of terminology as well. So I would say kind of the generic basic definition here is, you know, the consequences for participants, the group of people represented by the research. Your elaboration for that, if you like, or you're explaining in further detail is the implications of that. So you may give an example like we've just done with Bowlby's monotropic theory or perhaps another topic if you wish to do so. Right, let's have a look at the next question. So here we've got two questions. We've got STEM. Dr. Phillips and Dr. Sheridan are exploring the effectiveness of a new anti-anxiety medication. Dr. Phillips asked 20 participants to take part in an experiment and to rate their anxiety when faced with different types of stresses. So Dr. Sheridan asks five participants to meet him uh, for an unstructured interview to discuss life before and after the medication. So here you're having to identify which doctor is taking an ideographic approach? That would be a mark. The second mark comes from justifying your answer. Very same structure for the next one. Identify which doctor is taking a nomothetic approach, one mark. And then the second mark will be, again, justifying your answer. So if you want to have a go at pausing the video now to have a go at answering this, and then we'll be going through the mark scheme. Okay, so let's have a look at our mark scheme here for these two. 
So the first one, which doctor is taking an ideographic approach and justify your answer? So your mark here would be firstly for identifying it is in fact Dr. Sheridan and your justification would be your second mark as we spoke about before. So justification here is really going to be linking with what they've um, included in the STEM. So Dr. Sheridan obviously is using an interview method. So he's, um, he's getting responses from a small group of individuals and that type of research method is a associated with an ideographic approach. Again, you, you could have also mentioned that it's taking very much the subjective perspective and it's more qualitative, if you like, in terms of data collection uh, than a non-athetic approach. So that is the first part. So the second one for identifying which doctor takes a non-athetic approach and justification is Dr. Phillips. So that would be a mark. And your justification there is Dr. Phillips is using the experimental method. Um, you know, he is attempting to establish a law of behaviour. So let's have a look at the next one. Here we've got the discuss. So discuss free will and determinism debate in psychology. Refer to two topics you've studied in your answer. Now, obviously, this is our extended answer. Um, for 16 marks here, because it's discuss, you are going to be looking at AO1. You're also going to be looking at AO2 and the reason you're going to be applying is because it asks you to refer to two topics you've studied in your answer. And obviously you are going to need to be evaluating. But remember, discuss means looking at both sides, the so strengths and weaknesses. Now, the split here or the designation of split of marks for the assessment objectives, you're going to be expecting six for AO1, four for AO2 and six for AO3. So again, really encourage you to pause the video, either make quite a comprehensive plan for this or really encourage you to have a go at writing this out um, in full. So 16 marks, you're looking at around about 20 to 22 minutes timed. So if you want to have a go at pausing the video and then we'll go through the suggestive mark scheme in a moment. OK, let's have a look at the mark scheme then for this 16 marker. So we've got our possible content, our AO1, application AO2 and the discussion the AO3. So let's just go through some of the content. So obviously this was on free will determinism. It'd be good to make sure that we are demonstrating that we have knowledge of both by defining them. Um, sometimes demonstrating deeper knowledge of concepts um, can be done through illustration of an example for both. So that is an option in terms of demonstrating the examiner your deeper understanding of determinism and free will. There are varying degrees of determinism. We know it quoted in the spec just to remind you have hard and soft determinism. We also have psychic. We have a biological and environmental determinism. You wouldn't need to and you wouldn't have to define all of these here. Remember, it's always about being selective with your material. OK, and here they've defined also free will and what that means exactly. Now, the application here, when it says refer to two topics you've studied, that can be any topics from paper one, two and even three. Um, so you could link that to approaches, explanations of attachment. Um, so it, you've really got such a, a kind of wide variety, if you like, to choose and pick from. So <clears throat> an example might be. If we were going to be specific with psychic determinism, we might refer to the psychodynamic approach as an example. Um, for our biological determinism, we might refer to the biological approach. We could even refer to something more specific in terms of topics such as um, Bowlby's monotropic theory. Um, we could also refer to explanations of OCD in psychopathology. It's very much coming from a biological perspective. Um, for environmental determinism, again, we could refer to uh, the behaviourist approach. We could also refer to uh, really the opposite end of Bowlby's monotropic theory, so the learning theory, if we, if we wanted to do so. We could also refer to quite a few topics in social influence as well. For free will, we're probably the most obvious one to kind of link to here is our humanistic approach, OK, which places quite a lot of emphasis, if you like, on the idea that we have free will um, over our behaviour and our actions. Now, obviously, this was a discussed question, so we do need to provide both sides here in terms of strengths and or weaknesses. So here we may discuss the benefits of free will. 
we also may discuss the benefits of determinism um, and we also may flip that and play devil's advocate there may be benefits of free will but there also may be limitations in the sense that it's not very compatible with science a lot of um, psychologists argue that free will is is merely an illusion and it can't be tested empirically scientifically it can't be falsified but it is however compatible with our legal system um, because if we um, really do truly believe in this concept and side with the free will side of the debate we're saying that you know individuals can be punished for bad actions and rewarded for good actions if we say that they don't have any element of free will then that doesn't really marry up with our legal system in terms of punishing people for bad behaviour. So that's just a possible discussion to really think about going forward but hopefully you get the idea here and a reminder that discussion really does mean to discuss both sides in terms of the argument there of that particular debate. Okay so that is our section A for our issues and debates. We're now going to go on to section B. Again section B is 24 marks. Now in your paper you'll have the option of relationships, gender or cognitions and development. You would have only studied and been taught one of these at your centre so you really need to just choose the one and answer the questions on the one that you have been taught because obviously there is um, other sections as well. So we're going to go through all three, some questions from all three now, um, but you can really skip the ones um, that you haven't been taught and just focus on the ones here that you have. Um, we've also got um, eight marks here. OK, so that's about, let's say, 10 minutes. So really in total, you're looking at about 30 minutes here, which is about right for your 24 mark section. So I'd like you to pause the video now and have a go at these eight questions first time yourself for eight minutes I'll then go on to the 16 mark and you can time yourself and what we're going to do we'll go through the mark scheme um, for all four at the end so if you want to pause the video now and have a go at those questions okay so after you've had a go of those three questions let's have a look again at the 16 marker again what I'd like you to do is just pause the video and have a go at answering the 16 marker just before we go through the mark schemes for those four questions Okay, so hopefully you've had um, a go at answering that 16 marker. What we're going to do now is we're going to go through the mark scheme for those four relationship um, questions. So let's start with the first two markers. So we had two features of the investment model of relationships. Now, the key term here is identify. It's not explain, describe. We are just identifying. So here we've got our four bullet points. We would only need two. So we could have maybe mentioned satisfaction, comparison with alternatives, investment size or intrinsic, extrinsic investments. So as you can see from the mark scheme here, it's one mark for each correct feature that is identified. For a really, hopefully straightforward, simple key command, two mark there for identifying two features. So the next two mark we had this time explain one limitation of research into self-disclosure in virtual relationships. Now, um, the term research here, research can mean studies and or theories, explanations. If it's stated explain one limitation of a research study, you would have to evaluate a study. But because it says research, it really gives you a bit more of a bigger remit of what you may be able to evaluate if you like. So here are the possible content for a limitation of research into self-disclosure is issues with accuracy of the statements, reliance on obviously the honesty of participants, so we might be saying uh, bias or we might be saying social desirability bias, um, contradictory nature of the findings on self-disclosure as well, so any um, kind of research that may challenge the concept um, into self-disclosure in virtual relations would be credit worthy as well. Now, because this is only two marks, you're not going to be kind of doing an elaborative peel paragraph here. It's really about identifying the limitation and then explaining it for this two marks. So it's going to be arguably a bit briefer, if you like, than your evaluation peel paragraphs that you may be used to planning for 16 markers. And you can see here with the breakdown on the mark scheme uh, for two marks, the 
the explanation must be accurate, clear and include some elaboration. So that's where that second mark comes from. We've identified the limitation. We're then going to provide some elaboration and explain that. So looking at the uh, next question, the four marker, we've got outline the effects of absence of gating on the nature of virtual relationships. Now, I think the key, I mean, obviously the command word here is outline, so we know this is AO1, but I think the key point here and the prominent point here is the effects. Okay, so the effects of absence of gating on the nature of virtual relationships. So here the possible content. And again, because it says outline effects, we might be, you know, thinking plural here. And I would say that would probably be a safest best bet. So maybe two effects elaborated would be quite a strong kind of strategy here, if you like, for this full marker. So suggestive content we've got in face to face gates may prevent relationships um, from forming, absent in virtual relationships as we know, um, and obviously examples that you may give for either one of those points, you know, facial disfigurement, stammer, anxiety, for example, and people obviously can create online personalities that we can't really create in face to face. Um, so again, like I said, two kind of effects, they're elaborated, um, would suffice because it's plural here, outline the effects. Okay, so the 16 marker then moving on, like we discussed, this is an AO1, AO2 and AO3. And as we mentioned before, with the last 16 marker in issues and debates, the split here, especially when we have an AO2, is 6, 4 and 6. So if you'd like, um, potentially there's not as much evaluation if there was an AO2 because the AO2 marks have been grabbed from the AO3 component because AO3 is usually um, 10 marks as you guys know. So here the possible content we're outlining Duck's model of relationship breakdown here. So we know it's a phase model. Okay, we know there are four stages people go through when their relationship is starting to break down, when it breaks down. So we've got the four stages here stated in the possible content, intrapsychic phase, dyadic phase, social phase, and grave addressing phase. And obviously for each one of those, we might be thinking about, you know, elaborating, explaining, maybe giving an example even to demonstrate to the examiner we have that depth we have that deeper understanding if you like and remember each stage you don't move on to the next until you know um you've reached that threshold if you like okay now the application with regards to patrick and emily here we you can see with our application with the 60 markers we always say you really want to interlink the ao2 to so the application within the content and you can see for example in the content when you do, do when you do outline intrapsychic phase you can then link that to the stem you know patrick would lock himself away rather than confront her and this represents internal brooding Again, same when you outline dyadic phase in the content, you can then decide to, you know, link that with the stem. So Patrick and Emily decide to sit and talk about it. Same with social phase and the grave addressing phase there as well in terms of the link. Now, the discussion here, as we mentioned before, discuss means kind of demonstrating both sides, in other words, strengths and weaknesses. So we can state that obviously Duck's model of relationship breakdown has great real world applications specifically to relationship counselling and any evidence to support or if you like contradict this um, breakdown um, theory in terms of it being, you know, a very much phase model um, could be utilised here. Um, we could also arguably say that it's an incomplete model and some argue there's actually a fifth phase, the, resurre re the resurrection phase, sorry. And obviously uh, general issues with a lot of the research that underpins this model, you know, the use of self-report, it tends to be retrospective, which doesn't tend to be that reliable when we're looking at memories from, you know, a long time ago. Ethical issues as well when collecting that data and uh, culture bias is quite a nice one to utilise from um, issues and debates topic specifically that this model of relationship breakdown is very much based on individualistic cultures.
So that's our uh, relationships questions. We're just going to now move on to the gender section. So with our gender questions here, again, we've got three short questions and then we've got 16 markers. So let's just have a look at these three short questions. We've got identify two features of Klinefelter syndrome for two marks. Again, that key term identify, we went through this before in relationships. Then we've got explain a limitation of studying atypical sex chromosome patterns. And then lastly, our outline Kohlberg's explanation of gender development. So eight marks in total here, so roughly 10 minutes. If you want to have a go at pausing the video here and having a go at answering these three questions. OK, so hopefully you've had a go of those three questions there. I'm going to show you the 16 marker now for gender that I'd like you to have a go at. And again, encourage you to pause the video um, on this next one. So the next question here, we've got Jordan and Julie are comparing the gender development and making a list of differences and similarities between them. By the time they finish, they notice many more differences and similarities. For example, they have different reproductive systems and different genetics. They also have different temperaments, with Jordan stating that he's angry more often than Julie. So the question here is discuss again, discuss the role of chromosomes and hormones and gender development refer to Jordan and Julie in your answer. Now, I think the key aspect here is, again, we've got the command word discuss, but we've also got the role. So what is the role of chromosomes and hormones, specifically when we're explaining gender development? And again, we've got to refer to the stem Jordan and Julie here. So again, the split, just to remind you, is 6AO1, 4AO2 and 6AO3. So again, if you want to pause the video and then we will have a look at the mark scheme for the gender questions. OK, so hopefully you've had a go at that 16 marker. We're now going to have a look at the mark scheme for the four gender questions that you've just had a go at. So let's start with the first two mark. This was identify two features of Klinefeld syndrome. So because the command word here is identify, you just needed to state two features okay so here in the mark scheme we've got long limb long limbs xxy chromosome pattern issues with fertility you could have also said about you know a slim frame enlarged breasts as well um, so just two features need to be stated here for the two marks this we don't need to explain because the command word is just identify so the next question was explain the limitation of studying atypical sex chromosome patterns. So we are evaluating um, the concept of studying atypical sex chromosome patterns for two marks. So because it's two marks, really, we're looking at um, a limitation and then explained or elaborated, if you like. So we could say it's socially sensitive nature of the research. Um, because of it's atypical, if you like. Most research doesn't consider the complexities, if you like, of Klinefelter's or Turner's syndrome. And obviously there are individual differences, arguably, that may not be emphasised or maybe ignored, maybe, in the severity of the syndrome and actually coping with it too, which again can come into play with socially sensitive research. The next question then was our 16 marker. Um, so we've got here our AO1 possible content for the role of chromosomes and hormones in gender development. So we know last pair of chromosomes are the sex chromosomes and they're formed at conception, typically XX uh, for females and XY for males. But hormones we know are released during gestation reproductive systems uh, form. The brain is affected by testosterone production leading to a larger SDN region in males. Now, as we said before, when we have an application for a 16 marker, we're really wanting to mesh or amalgamate the application into the content. So when we are uh, outlining different reproductive systems caused by different hormones, varying hormones, if you like. We may link that to the stem in terms of, you know, Jordan will have an XY chromosome pair and will have experienced more testosterone exposure and production in the womb, leading to the male reproductive uh, system. And, you know, we can link that to maybe Jordan feeling angry because he has increased testosterone. And we may try and link Julie to our XX chromosome pair 
as well in being maybe calmer and, and not being uh, so angry. We may accentuate that difference between the differences in testosterone there, the increase in testosterone um, for an XY for males. Discussion there, as we've mentioned before, discuss really does mean giving both strengths and weaknesses. So again, research support is a really nice one or contradictory support. Issues with animal research into this topic and also case studies in terms of generalizability. Um, implications for treatment in terms of, you know, aiding and helping, you know, gender identity disorders um, or atypical development, if you like. Um, social sensitivity, again, is a really nice one to use for a lot of gender. Actually, we can recycle that that issue. And again, with other debates, we can also be discussing that it's biologically reductionist, biologically deterministic as well in terms of um, gender development. And we can contrast this with other explanations, but we can also arguably say because this is very much biological chromosomes and hormones, that it does adhere to the scientific rigour of, you know, what we want to be as a science, you know, in terms of objectivity, for example. So there's quite a lot there to discuss, but as I said before, your AO3 is going to be six marks worth. And although we don't like to say six marks worth, in terms of the mark designation for an application essay, you know, the A1, the A2 and A3, it's quite nice to be mindful of that because it will really give you an indication of the ratio, if you like, of the amount of time you should spend on each section. Um, so usually you might be looking and aiming to do three peel paragraphs for a generic kind of outline and evaluate 16 marker. When we have AO2 and a 16 marker, you might be, you know, um, doing two peel points um, as a difference here because it's worth less marks. So, um, our next topic in this section is cognition and development. So we've got three questions in a 16 marker again. So identify two features of Vygotsky's theory of cognitive development for two marks. Again, we've got that key term identify. So do remember what that means. Explain one limitation. And here we've got other than ethics with using children in research into cognitions and development for two marks. And then lastly, outline the role of the mirror neuron system in social cognition. Um, so again, this is eight marks worth of questions. If you wanna pause the video and have a go at these, and then uh, we'll look at the 16 mark and we'll be going through the mark schemes. Okay, let's move on to the 16 marker now. So our 16 marker, again, we've got an application 16 marker here. So Constantine is comp completing his psychology coursework, which involves exploring cognitive development in children. His first participant is Sam, four months old, and his second participant is Craig, who's eight months old. Constantine finds that when an object is hidden from view, Craig continues to look for it, but Sam does not. Participants three and four are asked to decide whether there are more, less, or the same number of pennies on a table once they have been spread out. Participant three, who's five years old, states there are more pennies once they are spread out, but participant four, who's 10 years old, does not. Quite a lot going on in that stem. So the question here is discuss Piaget's theory of cognitive development and refer to the above scenario in your answer. Now, just a reminder of the split here with marks 6AO1, 4AO2 and 6AO3. Um, but there's a lot going on in the stem there. So um, really do be mindful and try to, when you outline Piaget's theory of cognitive development, to link that as you're outlining it with the stem and, and an easy way of doing that is quoting the stem in a meaningful way in conjunction with your AO1. So if you want to have, pause the video now and have a go answering that question and then after that we'll be going through the mark schemes for these questions on cognition and development. Okay, let's have a look at the mark scheme then for these questions. So the first one was our identify. So again, a mark for each correct feature that is identified. So zone of proximal development, scaffolding. And again, because this is identified, we wouldn't need to explain. We just need to state the correct feature in terms of Vygotsky's theory of cognitive development. 
The next question was explain one limitation other than ethics. So we're not allowed to use that point here um, with using children in research into cognition and development. So two marks, again, it'd be really identifying a limitation and explaining it for the two marks. So here we've got difficulties with questioning. Children may not understand the question, therefore answers lack validity. We could also state about individual differences. It's hard to quantify where children are up to in their cognitive development. Some children develop faster, slower than others. So again, explain one limitation. If this was four marks, um, we would be looking to do one limitation in a bit more detail. So we'd be looking to maybe extend that into kind of a full peel point, if you like. Because this is two marks, it is really about, you know, dividing that up a mark for identifying the limitation and a second mark for explaining it. Our next question, the four mark was outline the role of the mirror neuron system in social cognition. So for four marks here, this would be marked in levels most likely because it's four marks. So we've got mirror neurons in the motor cortex may allow the actions of others to be simulated, copied, helping to increase empathy and understanding. And mirroring motor activity in another individual discovered using animal research and mirror neurons fire in response to the actions of other people. And I think the key... You know, the key word here is outline. OK, that is correct. So we are AO1 and we are describing, but it's not just outline mirror neuron systems. It's the role of them, which is slightly different. And this comes up quite a lot in the specification in AQA, the role of something slightly different from just describing it. We're really wanting to know, OK, what's its purpose more like? So, again, just um, slow down, make sure you're reading the question. You know, you're not just highlighting the command word like outline. What follows that? What really are they asking you to write about? And then our 16 mark here, we had quite a lot going on for the application. So our, our content here for Piaget's theory of cognitive development, we've got, um, you know, the focus on it was on what motivates us to learn and how we learn through our development. And that's divided into stages as we know and then as we learn our cognitions become much more complex as we get older and we use schemas to interpret the rap the world around us and we should here maybe be explaining what we mean by a schema so we've got assimilation takes place when we understand a new experience and accommodation takes place when a schema must be changed after new learning has taken place and they are two important key terms I would say that would need to be included here in Piaget's theory you know assimilation schemas and accommodation so you want to make sure that you've got those in your content so the application here like I said there's quite a lot going on in the stem so um here we've got individual differences in the responses from the children. So Sam, who is four months old, does not look for the missing object, but Craig does, who's older, which demonstrates the assumption that child children's cognitive development becomes more complex as we age, which links with what we just went over in the content. So you really want to kind of mesh those two together. You know, when you explain about that, that um, a child's cognitive development becomes more complex with age, you might then quote that in, in conjunction with that piece of content. Now, participant three is unable to conserve but participant four can, which again demonstrates the impact of age and development and the role of schemas in learning. So again, in your content, when you do outline what schemas and, and what role they play in Piaget's theory of cognitive development, you might then decide to quote this part of the stem in a meaningful way. And then lastly, our discussion, remember, just to remind a discussion means both sides, so strength and weakness. So here we've got individual differences in learning, application to education um some more individual differences points you know some children are more motivated to learn and explore than others um and we might piaget may have overestimated the motivation of all children and piaget lastly may have had a simplified view of language and underestimated the complexity that language plays in the role of cognitive development so we're going to move on to section C now, which includes schizophrenia, eating behaviour or stress. So obviously, you will just be answering one section here in section C. So whichever one you've been taught is the one that you want to skip to. You don't need to do all three here. So just do the one that you have been taught. We're going to start with schizophrenia today. So we're going to have a look at a couple of questions here. 
we've got a four and a six marker. So explain one difference between typical and atypical antipsychotic medication. And then evaluate the use of token economies in the management of schizophrenia. So this is 10 marks altogether. So should give you approximately 12, 13 minutes to answer. So if you want to pause the video and have a go at both of these questions, and then we'll go through a few more questions and then we'll go through the mark scheme for all of schizophrenia together. Okay, let's have a look at a few more questions. For so here we have um, a STEM. Um, a researcher carried out a series of double blind drug trials where participants were not told the true purpose of the research and the research was also blind to at least some aspects of the research design. The trials were conducted over a six week period to assess the effectiveness of an antipsychotic drug and a placebo in reducing symptoms of schizophrenia. So here we've got the graph that shows the results of the double blind drugs trial with orange being placebo and blue being antipsychotic medication. And um, we've got the number of participants there as well. So over to the far left, we've got very much improved, almost working like a Likert scale. And to the far right, we've got very much worse. So you might want to take a photo of this uh, graph here because on the next slide, we've got a few questions that are going to entail you to kind of uh, use this graph in helping you answer the questions. So we've got briefly explain why placebo may have been used in this study. So again, you've got to be study specific there for two marks. Summarise the findings of this study using the data in the graph above and explain what it shows about schizophrenia, four marks. Imagine you're writing up the report for this study. What is the purpose of the discussion section in a psychological report? So that's not asking you to give the discussion. It's asking you what's the purpose of it. Then we've got outline the assumption of the interactionist explanation of schizophrenia, two marks. And lastly, evaluate the cognitive explanation for schizophrenia. So you want to time yourself roughly about 20 minutes to answer these questions. So if you pause the video now and after we'll go through the mark scheme for those questions. OK, so hopefully you've had a trial at answering some of those. We're going to go through the mark scheme now, going right to the start with our first couple of questions. So explain a difference between typical and atypical. So this this is very different from just outline typical and atypical. It's about a difference. So you really want to be thinking about our connective words like whereas or in contrast. So typical drugs act as dopamine antagonist by blocking its uptake at the synapse, um, whereas atypical drugs act on dopamine along with other neurotransmitters thought to be involved in schizophrenic symptoms such as serotonin and glutamate. Typical drugs were developed to tackle the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, but are not so effective for negative symptoms because Atypical drugs aim to tackle positive and negative symptoms is the difference there. Um, and you can obviously give differences of those particular side effects as well. But I think the key thing here is, is difference. So it is about using um, a point and that same point to demonstrate the difference between typical and atypical. So again, like we said, using those connective words like in contrast, whereas. Next question was evaluate the use of token economies in the management of schizophrenia for six marks. So evaluate, we could just give just strengths, we could just give weaknesses, we could do strengths and weaknesses. You've got a choice here. So here we've got evidence to suggest that they're obviously effective improving behaviour in psychiatric hospitals, but they do not address symptoms of schizophrenia. Um, they're not necessarily a treatment. They need to be used in conjunction with other methods you know, like therapy or drug therapy. Um, it's not effective with unresponsive patients, specifically those with very severe negative symptoms who are really struggling with motivation. Um, and we can also arguably say the use of token economies in management of schizophrenia might not be, the evidence might not be there in terms of, you know, when they are um, discharged from a hospital that actually token economy system may not be as applicable in real life because obviously um, you know tokens if you like or rewards don't necessarily come instantaneously in the real world you know we might not get paid as soon as we do a good job or a good deed we may get paid you know 
a few weeks later at the end of the month. So it may not be as transferable, if you like, in terms of um, integrating back into the community. We could also argue that point as well. Now, this is six marks. So my suggestion here would be giving two um, evaluative points here and elaborating those. It'd be quite difficult to just give one point um, and kind of demonstrate to the examiner that skill set, unless you were going to play devil's advocate or double whopper burger, as we like to call it. But I think two points is the safer option here for six marks. And again, you'd have roughly about eight minutes of writing it. So more than doable, we could say, to give um, two points. OK, so the next question here, we've got um, looking at our graph and, and this is linked to the stem that that we had before. So briefly explain why placebo may have been used in this study. And I think that the important thing here is in this study, a lot of students miss that out. You've got to be stem specific or study specific. So there needs to be a condition where no drug is given which is the control um, condition. So giving a placebo controls for the belief that they are simply not getting treated. All patients share the belief that they are being treated therefore. OK, so again, being study specific there in this study, we are talking about the drug, we are talking about the placebo, etc. OK, so that's how we've been study specific there. Our next question was a four mark. This was to do with the findings. So summarise the findings of this study using the data in the graph above and explain lastly what it shows about schizophrenia. So it's all, almost like two parts to this question. We're summarising the findings and then we're also explaining what those findings show about schizophrenia. So the content here is a greater number of patients improved whilst taking an antipsychotic drug when we compare that to a placebo and more patients reported no change to their symptoms or they felt worse in the placebo condition. A small number of patients reported their symptoms had much improved whilst taking the placebo, however. So there were some patients, although a smaller number, that reported their symptoms were much worse or very worse while taking an antipsychotic. So it's kind of mixed, uh, mixed kind of reviews of that drug and the placebo there. So explain what it shows about schizophrenia. If we look at those two two first bullet points, well it shows that actually antipsychotic drugs when compared to a placebo, you know, taking um, a drug therapy rather than a placebo does improve symptoms of schizophrenia or, you know, helps patients feel better, if you like, in terms of their symptoms. Um, but obviously with those two last bullet points, you know, it does mean that there were some patients that reported their symptoms were much worse and that could be due to side effects. Also, we could arguably say about about drugs, uh, drug therapy and uh, improvements or not improvements in schizophrenia. All right, our next question, imagine you're writing up the report for this study again. This was what is the purpose of the discussion section in a psychological report for two marks? So for two marks, you know, a point elaborated would suffice here. So the discussion, what does it involve? It involves a summary of results in verbal rather than a statistical form because we are discussing them. This is done in the context of the hypothesis and research presented in the introduction. Um, and the research would also discuss the limitations of the investigation and maybe make suggestions for how these could be managed and consider any wider implications. And then we've got evaluate the cognitive explanation for schizophrenia for four marks. So we've got quite a lot of suggestions here for our possible um, evaluation. So for four marks, you could do one point fully peeled, fully elaborated, if you like, or you could do two. Depends what you can write in roughly five minutes here. You could also play uh, devil's advocate or if we like to call it a double whopper burger point. So we've got research support. Um, we've got contradictory research. We could also say um, success of cognitive treatments to reduce symptoms, which obviously uh, gives the cognitive explanation much validity um, in explaining schizophrenia. Um, issues with uh, cognitive explanations being proximal to explanations. Unable to account for the indisputable fact that schizophrenia runs in families and that the increased risk is directly associated with the degree of relatedness. So it ignores that in terms of our um, biological explanation. So we can compare that with other approaches. Um, difficulty in cause and effect as well. You know, does faulty thinking cause schizophrenia or does schizophrenia cause faulty thinking? It's not quite clear. 
And we can also use the diathesis stress model as a way of uh, reconciling the biological and psychological explanation together. Okay, eating behaviour questions then. So we've got a four and a six mark here. Outline one or more psychological explanations for obesity and evaluate the role of learning in food preference. So 10 marks here all together. So you roughly have about kind of 13, 14 minutes here to answer this. So if you want to pause the video to have a go answering both these questions, if you have been taught eating behaviour as one of your topics. Okay, so hopefully you've had a go at answering both those questions. Let's have a look at the stem with our graph here. So a researcher aimed to investigate the influence of learning and food preference. He recruited 40 volunteers and randomly allocated them into one of two groups. 100% of participants had declared their love of chocolate during the volunteer process. One group were given chocolate plus an emetic that would make them sick. Um, the other group were given chocolate without the emetic and the researcher wanted to see if people could be classically conditioned to learn a taste aversion. All participants were asked to report whether they did or did not like chocolate by the end of the study and the results are shown in this graph. So we've got with the emetic and without the emetic and then we've got the number of participants who reported a dislike for chocolate. So you might want to again just take a, a screenshot or a photo of this um, stem here with the graph before we go on to the questions that correspond with it. So we've got five questions here. Briefly explain why a control group has been used in this study. So again, it's in this study. It's study specific for two marks. Summarise the findings in this study using the data in the graph above and explain what it shows about food preferences. Four marks. Imagine you're writing up the report for this study. What is the purpose of the discussion section in a psychological report? Outline one assumption of the evolutionary explanations for food preferences. And lastly, we've got evaluate family systems theory as a psychological explanation of anorexia nervosa. So again, what I'd like you to do is pause the video here and have a go answering these questions. So we've got... Um, doo -doo 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 about 14 marks here so if you want to give yourself roughly 20 minutes to answer these questions. Okay so hopefully you've had a go at answering some of those questions. We're going to go through the mark scheme now starting from the start with the first full mark. Outline one or more psychological explanations for obesity. So we've got the restraint theory we could um, have outlined here for four marks. Remember it says one or more so you could do one in detail for four marks or two briefly that would be your strat there would be your options for the strategy here in terms of answering this so restraint theory is its counterproductive nature of restrained eating um, that's uh, encompassing the cognitive control. Disinhibition restraint and disinhibition cycle all or nothing thinking and then the boundary model as well. So the boundary limit and the um, statutory boundary are far apart. So again, like I said, one in lots of detail if you feel confident doing that for four marks or you could do two in less detail. So our six mark next was evaluate the role of learning and food preference. This isn't evaluate just learning and food preference, it's the role of it, the role that it plays in food preference. So here we've got classical conditioning may be more useful in explaining aversion rather than food preference. And we can, you know, we can encompass some research there to uh, demonstrate that point. As we get older, different models influence us. This change is hard to explain with the learning theory. And we could also bring in the family and cultural influences can affect food preference in supporting the role of learning. So again, evaluate the role of learning is kind of, you know, if you like, if we're going to reword that, um, how can the role of learning uh, successfully explain food preference? And then maybe we might also be saying actually maybe the role doesn't fully explain food preference as well. So that's kind of where out that evaluation um, is stemming from, if you like. So six marks, we would expect two points here, I would say, but like we said before, be quite difficult just to um, give one point here and demonstrate to the examiner the skill that you need to demonstrate for those six marks. Or you could play double whopper devil's advocate, but I would say for six marks, it's eight minutes of writing, you would have time there to definitely peel two points for this. 
Okay, so going back to our graph and the stem, uh, briefly explain why control group has been used in this study. So again, it's study specific and a lot of students miss that out. So make sure you, you, you know, take note of when it says in this study or refer to, you know, you are having to be stem specific. So the control group allows the researcher to see food preferences without the effect of being paired with an emetic. And it's the benchmark for typical behaviour and food preferences, which the experimental group can be compared to. The next one is summarise the findings. This is a two part question. So we're summarising the findings, but also explaining what it shows about food preference. So the participants who are most likely to report a dislike of chocolate were the ones who associated with the emetic. Some participants reported a dislike of chocolate even without the emetic. Although 100% reported liking chocolate before the study, food preference was changed through learning and classical conditioning. And more people change their mind about liking chocolate after the study if they're exposed to the experimental conditions to the emetic. Next question is the purpose of the discussion in a psychological report. So again, the discussion involves a summary of results in verbal rather than statistical form, and it's done in the context of the hypothesis and research presented in the introduction. Furthermore, the research could also discuss the limitations of the investigation and obviously make suggestions of how these could be managed and also consider wider implications as well. So outline the assumption of evolutionary explanations for food preference for two marks. So we've got we have evolved uh, to prefer sweet tastes. A preference for salt is evident in humans for approximately four months old. And neophobia is the innate unwillingness to try new foods and has evolved to keep us safe. So again, it is just about one assumption. So you would only need one of those and one of those then explained or elaborated for the two marks would be good enough. And then we've got our last question here for um, eating behaviour. Evaluate family systems theory as a psychological explanation of, of anorexia nervosa for four marks. So research evidence is the obvious one you should evaluate. Also implications we can be thinking about, positive implications for treatments such as behavioural family systems therapy, BFST. And lastly, cause and effect is hard to establish since the relationship is bi-directional. OK, our next section is stress for this section. So again, let's have a look at the first couple of questions. Then we're going to have a look at a STEM with some findings. So this is outline the general adaptation syndrome as a physiological response to stress with four marks um, and evaluate research into workplace stress. So 10 marks altogether, you're roughly going to have about, um, let's say, 13, 14 minutes here to answer this. If you want to pause the video now to have a go answering these. Okay, moving on then, we're going to have a look at um, a STEM now with some findings and some further questions, then we're going to go through the mark scheme all together. So here we've got a researcher aimed to investigate gender differences in coping with stress. To do this, she asked 20 males and 20 females to complete a self-report questionnaire about how they usually respond in stressful situations. The questionnaire included questions such as, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you seek support from others when you are faced with a stressful situation? and explain how you respond when you encounter a stressful situation. Based on their responses, each participant was given a stress score by the researcher. A high score indicated more use of a particular coping strategy and a low score indicated less use of the coping strategy. The average score for the males and females can be seen in the graph. So we've got seek support from others, get angry, cry, problem solve, and then we've got average score of men and women. Men being the blue bars and women being the orange bars. So you might want to take a photo of this just before we have a look at the questions that coincide with this stem. So we've got five questions. Briefly explain one limitation of using a questionnaire in this study. Summarise the findings of this study using the data in the graph above and explain what it shows about gender differences in coping with stress. Imagine you're writing up the report for this study. What is the purpose of the discussion section in a psychological report? Outline one assumption about the role of life changes in stress. And then lastly, evaluate the use of stress inoculation therapy as a way of managing and coping with stress. So if you want to have a pause of the video now, give yourself roughly about 20 minutes to answer these questions and then we'll be going through the mark scheme.
Okay, so hopefully you've had um, a little trial of those questions. We're going to go through the mark scheme now. Going back to that first full marker, outline the general adaptation syndrome as a physiological response to stress. We respond to stress in stages, according to this theory. So there's an alarm reaction. So bodily responses are activated when we encounter a stressor. Then there's resistance. The body attempts to adapt to the stressor. And then we've got exhaustion, adaptation uh, to the stressor fails. Our next question then, evaluate research into workplace stress. So for six marks, strategy here, I would say two points in pill format. You would have roughly about eight minutes to uh, write the answer to this six marker. So we've got cultural differences. There is lack of control in, in work is more stressful for individualistic cultures in comparison to collectivist cultures. Of course, you can bring some research in there if you have a piece. Inconsistent views. Um, some consider too much control at work to be stressful rather than too little control. And that might come into individual differences where we might be able to um, include that. Some research into this area is done with natural experiments. So the sawmill study, for example, meaning that although high in ecological validity, there are individual differences in coping with stress. They're actually not controlled and maybe not thought through here. So again, evaluate for the six marks, I would say two evaluation points peeled, or you could do a double whopper burger, you know, really well discussed kind of um, devil's advocate point there for six marks. Okay, so looking back at our stem with the graph, briefly explain a limitation of using a questionnaire in this study. So again, it's in this study, which is key, that's being STEM specific, remember. So participants may not want to be honest about how they cope with stressful situations and may withhold information, lie or leave questions out. And this affects the validity of the study. So quite a few key terms there. Um, so, you know, they might, uh, when we're talking about bias or lying, we could bring in social desirability bias, but we do need to be um, discussing or mentioning validity here. How it affects the overall validity of the study is really key. Our next question then, summarise the findings, is the first part of the question. And the second part is explain what it shows about gender differences in coping with stress. So the findings, more women in this study report using social support as a coping method in comparison to men. Men are more, much more likely to get angry than women when stressed and men are less likely than women and less likely to cry when they are angry. So what does this show? It shows that there are clear gender differences in how males and females cope with stress. So again, we've answered both components there of that question. So really important to not just ignore that last part, you know, once you've summarised the findings, we need to explain what it actually shows about gender differences in coping with stress. Our next question then is about the purpose of the discussion section. So the discussion is a, a summary of results in verbal rather than statistical form, and it's done in the context of the hypothesis and research presented in the introduction. Um, and it also encompasses discussion of the limitations of the investigation, as well as suggestions of how they can be managed, improved and any wider implications as well. Outline an assumption about the role of life changes in stress. So life changes cause stress, which increases the likelihood of stress related illnesses. And they can be measured using life change units and quantifying the amount of stress someone has experienced. And our last question then um, for stress is evaluate the use of stress inoculation therapy as a way of managing and coping with stress. So for four marks here, you could do one point peeled, you know, in detail. You could do two points um, in, in briefer kind of uh, detail if you wish to do that strategy. So it's flexible method and can support um, with a range of stress coping techniques. It is a demanding therapy and may not be suitable for absolutely everybody. So individual differences we can bring into play there. And obviously research support for the effectiveness of the treatment. Or you could also say um, research to support the, you know, that it's not effective as well. 
uh, you know that research can can be demonstrated both ways if you like so evaluate really is strengths and or weaknesses there remember um, so we can give limitations and or strengths so our last section section d is aggression forensics um, or addiction so again you would have just been taught one of these sections so skip to the section that you have been taught and again encourage you to have a go at those questions and we'll be going through the mark scheme so we're going to start with aggression questions so outline neural and or hormonal mechanisms in aggression we have an option there we could do both or we could just do one or the other for four marks and then we've got our 16 marker outline and evaluate the role of media influences in aggression it's that tricky word there the role of it uh, yeah so the role of media influences in aggression so that would be a six and ten so uh, six marks for a1 ten marks for ao three so if you want to pause the video now and have a go answering um, those questions before we move on to some further questions and then we'll look at the mark scheme for aggression okay so moving on let's have a look at some more aggression questions here we've got um, a table of findings so the stem here is the government employed a team of researchers to investigate the effects of violent computer games on young girls and boys they hypothesized that there would be a difference in the number of aggressive acts from males and females depending on the time spent playing violent computer games the number of aggressive acts was recorded during an observation of their playground behavior so here the table shows the number of acts of aggression in girls and boys and here you're being asked to identify which statistical test would be appropriate to use to analyze these results and justify your choice and this is four marks so you really want to be thinking about the statistical test and justification in terms of the data type in terms of the design so whether it's you know repeated independent matched and also whether it's testing a difference or correlation so again, four marks, this will be a roughly five minutes that you have to complete that question. So if you want to pause the video now, time yourself for five minutes, have a go answering that question, then we're going to go through the mark scheme for the aggression questions. Okay, so let's have a look at our first aggression four marker, outline neural and or hormonal mechanisms in aggression. So obviously here for neural mechanisms, we can talk about and discuss the limbic system here. So the role of the amygdala, the hippocampus, the septum, the reactivity of the amygdala in humans and other mammals is seen as an important predictor of aggressive behavior. Remember the amygdala is the emotional processing center of the brain. Hippocampus, we can link that to memory formation. So if any of these are damaged, it means that we can't actually um, process emotions or stressful situations as well as what we normally would. And as a result, we may um, behave and react aggressively or violently. Um, aggression is linked to decreased levels of serotonin in the orbital frontal cortex, reducing self-control. That comes under neural mechanisms as well. And in terms of hormonal, we can be outlining uh, testosterone. So we know the increases in testosterone from quite a few studies have related to increases in aggressive acts. Now, of course, this is an outline. So if you've got research to demonstrate these concepts, you can include that here as long as you're using the research to demonstrate the AO1 concepts as opposed to using it to evaluate because this is an AO1 question. It's outlined as a key term, as a command word here. So again, you are given an option. So you could have just outlined neural or hormonal or if you wanted to, you could have done both. So the next question here um, was our um, identifying the stats test. We're going to look at the 16 marker in, uh, after this. So the stats test here would have been a chi-square. So that would have been one mark. And the rest of your marks would have come from justifying. So the researchers are investigating a difference. OK, and the data is in the form of categories. So it's nominal data and the data is unrelated. OK, so it's independent. So our 16 marker here for outline and evaluate the role of media influences in aggression. So we've got our um, theories here, cognitive priming, desensitization, disinhibition. Um, again, you can link it specifically to computer games if you want, because you, you need to know that specifically. But you could just do it to any type of media. You know, computer games is a type of media at the end of the day. Um, 
possible discussion here so in terms of evaluating the role you might be thinking about okay there's evidence to suggest that the role um, of media really does influence aggression and you might also be saying actually there's evidence that actually media doesn't really um, influence aggression to that degree or, or that much so we've got evidence here to your support or refute it um, we can also state that a lot of the research that underpins media influences and aggression is correlational um, and we can also say a lot of it is lab based. So, again, there's issues, there's pros and cons to lab based studies. We know that from research methods. Um, counter argument viewing violent images may be quite cathartic and may prevent actual expression of violence. Um, also, individual differences perhaps isn't, isn't accounted for to, to, to that extent in this theory. And we can also say analysis of implications of media influences and aggression, so the need for media regulation. So because this is, there's no AO2 here and it's AO16 marks, 10 marks for AO3, we would be, you know, you want to be aiming for three peel points, three evaluation points here. So forensics, moving on, we've got two questions. We've got outline the psychodynamic explanation of offender behaviour for four marks and then outline and evaluate the top down approach to offender profiling for 16 marks. So you're six and 10 there again as, as previous. So if you want to have a go at pause in the video now to have a go at answering both of these, we'll then look at one more question and we'll go through the mark scheme for all of forensics. OK, so hopefully you've had a go answering both of those questions. We're going to have a look at a STEM question now, which is an identify stats test, which would be appropriate to analyse the results above. So if you have a read of the STEM, you're needing to justify your choice of the stats test in terms of, you know, the level of data and the design. So whether it's independent, repeated match and also whether it's a test of correlation or difference. So for four marks, you'd have roughly five minutes to answer this. If you want to pause the video and then we're going to go through the mark scheme for all of forensics questions together. OK, so we're going to go through the mark scheme for the forensics questions. So starting with our four marker, outlining the psychodynamic explanation of offender behaviour. So here, offenders may have formed different super egos, so not typical development, in other words. So again, we've got the outline of the different types of super egos. So the underdeveloped one is the weak super ego. The deviant super ego is an internalised the super ego of a deviant criminal behaviour. And a harsh super ego is driven by guilt and desire to be punished. So outlining that we would probably expect you to, you know, maybe outline all of the super egos or a couple of those in detail. OK, and I think we need to remember generally just with psychodynamic, there's actually generally quite a lot uh, that tends to be to outline. So this is only a four marker. So it's five mark, five minutes, sorry, to write this. So outlining each of those super egos should be more than doable. But if you don't get time to do that, then at least a couple of those outlined in detail with examples or demonstrations, if you like, would also suffice. We're going to look at the 16 mark next. So this was on the top down approach. So obviously this is the FBI um, approach to offender profiling and it's based on interviews with 36 sexually motivated serial killers. It's about pre-existing templates developed by the FBI and they're classified as organised or disorganised. And of course, you can give details of what an organised, disorganised criminal may present like in terms of their crime scene, if you like, and, and what they may be like. FBI profile is constructed through data assimilation, then crime scene classification, then reconstruction and then a profile generation. It's really important that you understand those steps because this actually has been a previous AQA question about top down. So remember, you've got data assimilation, crime scene classification, reconstruction and profile generation. Now, our evaluation of the top down approach, of course, we can compare that with um, the bottom up approach. Firstly, because you know that anyway for offender profiling. We do know with top down, it's really useful for certain types of crime like murder, but not so useful um, for things like theft or fraud. Um, and the template is based um, and built upon the assumption that personality is stable, but obviously personality is a forever changing, um, you know, thing. So it may be quite outdated. Um, and not very valid in terms of this theory, in terms of explaining uh, offender profiling. 
You could bring in research that supports top down or even research that challenges it. Um, and we could say that the research that underpins the top down, you know, the original sample um, was very specific. And there are concerns, therefore, about relying on the answers and self-report insights from convicted killers specifically to formulate this particular approach. And like I said at the start, you know, you learn bottom up. So why not contrast it to that profiling as well? So because you've got, you know, your AO1 and your AO3 here, six and ten, you're probably aiming for roughly six evaluation peeled points here for your evaluation section. And then our stats test one, so identifying stats test, then justifying our choice here. It's a chi-square, so researchers are investigating a difference. It's category, so it's nominal data, and it's unrelated, it's independent. So our next topic, our last one, is addiction. So our first two addiction questions are... Um, outline Prochaska's six-stage model of behaviour change and outline and evaluate risk factors in the development of addiction for 16 marks. So if you want to pause the video here and have a go answering the four marker and the 16 marker, we'll then go through a stats um, addiction question and then we'll go through the mark scheme all together. OK, so looking at our research methods addiction question, we've got identify which stats test would be appropriate to use to analyse these results and justify your choice. So have a read of the STEM. Remember, you're justifying this in terms of level of data and the design, so whether it's independent, repeated match, and also whether it's testing a correlation or difference. So if you want to pause the video here, give yourself five minutes to answer this and then we'll be going through the mark scheme. OK, so let's go through the mark scheme for all of those addiction questions. Let's start with our first one, our four marker. So we've got quite a lot of content here. So it is about, you know, uh, being selective. We're not probably for five minutes of writing for four marks going to be able to discuss each stage in detail. So it's about being selective here for outlining this six stage model of behaviour. So overcoming addiction is a um, cyclical process. We've got pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, maintenance and termination. So I think it's about, you know, definitely identifying and naming the six stages. And we might decide for four marks to maybe elaborate on maybe two or three of those by giving, you know, demonstrations, examples. Um, so really important here, it says here in the mark scheme, students do not have to talk about all six stages to access four marks. But I would say here, strategy wise, for a similar question, you know, do name the stages, but you might decide just to elaborate and explain maybe only two or three of those, depending on, you know, um, your speed of writing and what you can perform in five minutes. 16 marker then, we've got our outline, the risk factors in the development of addiction. So we've got our internal, external influences, genetic vulnerability, genetic mechanisms like genes, personality and family influences. There's quite a lot there. Um, and you wouldn't need to give all of those. You know, our AO1 is six marks, so roughly eight minutes of writing. So again, it's about being selective with what you decide to outline. And obviously, whatever you outline, we're going to be evaluating. So we've got research support for the different types of risk factors, support or contradictory evidence even. Um, and obviously, the idea that it's very unlikely that one risk factor is influential on its own. It's more likely there's an interaction between maybe some of the um, factors that you put into your AO1. It's not about just one. Research that underpins this area of risk factors is often correlational. So obviously, you know, cause and effect can be quite hard to establish. And we can also say real life application, you know, using these risk factors to identify those who are vulnerable to addiction is, is going to be quite useful in terms of real world. So for the 60 marks here, you know, your AO1 and your AO3, you're looking at six and 10. So for 10 marks for your evaluation, you're really looking at aiming for, you know, three peeled points. And then we've got our um, stats test as our last question. So this is a chi-square and our justification here is investigating a difference. Our level of data is nominal and it's unrelated, it's independent, lastly. So I hope you found that useful. That was our advanced information for paper three, paper walkthrough.